So let me start then. I'm sure that many of you know that Toronto actually is a major opera hub in North America. Uh, what you may be less aware of is that beyond the large companies, Canadian Opera Company and perhaps Opera Atelier, there are quite a number of other companies in the city, smaller perhaps, but this is where a great deal of really creative operatic activity is actually happening. Our speaker today, Michael Hidetoshi Mori, is a general director of one of those companies, Tapestry Opera. Now, Tapestry is a very well established, a highly successful, and an innovative independent opera company. As a collaborator, I have to say that Michael was the, was the founder, one of the founders of Indie Opera TO, and he brought together 11 of these smaller companies uh, to offer a different kind of opera. So Michael's opera career started when he was a boy soprano in New York City, and it took him to a master's degree in opera performance at the University of British Columbia. Along the way, he moved from performance to directing and artistic administration, and he began his current position at Tapestry in 2014. At Tapestry, he has really vigorously promoted the commissioning and the performance of new Canadian works, several of which have been award winners, such as Tapestry's adaptation of The Overcoat by Morris Penich with music by James Rolfe. Michael's own direction of Rocking Horse Winner earned nine Dora Maver Moore nominations and gar garnered five awards, including those for Outstanding Production and Outstanding Director for Michael himself. Michael is also has a flourishing freelance directing career in Canada and the United States. So Canada, um, Michael has been an important advocate for opera in Canada. He's the board chair of the Association for Opera in Canada. And he's been active within Opera America, which is an umbrella group for opera companies in North America. He also represented Canada at the 2018 World Opera Forum in Madrid. Tapestry Opera has flourished under his direction. It's increased its number of performances and extended its innovation. He has begun a fellowship program to advance female conductors called Women in Musical Leadership. The highlights of the usual tapestry season include Lib Lab, which is a sort of speed dating intensive for composers and librettists. And Michael himself has initiated Tapestry Explorations or TAPEX, where the boundaries of the operatic form are tested in mashups with other kinds of music, such as heavy metal, or a combination of Persian music and hip hop. So today, Michael is going to speak about Tapestry's ongoing experiments in a talk entitled Sacrilege or Survival, Opera in Adaptive Mediums. Over to you, Michael. You have to unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you. That's, a, that's the best introduction I've ever had. So. <laughs> Um, I, well, thank you so much to Michael and Linda for inviting me to speak today. Uh, it's a great pleasure and knowing how uh, well prepared and thoughtful they are as speakers and writers, I'm slightly intimidated, but I'm also very enthusiastic about what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I just wanted to add that I, I share the leadership of Tapestry Opera with Executive Director Jamie Martino. And uh, for a little bit of context, it is the 10th largest company in Canada with a budget of around one and a half million. Um, it's around 40 years old, so it rivals most of the major companies in terms of age um, and uh, is arguably North America's most prolific commissioner and producer of new operas. So to start everything off, I thought I would share, if this technology works well, um, a little bit of opera with you. Uh, the context of this is that um, after the um, the first sort of, I guess, beginnings of the crisis happened last year, and uh, many of us were in working in performing arts were forced to reconsider how we look at our seasons and, and certainly to cancel live performances. Um, we began experimenting with what was possible with online collaborations back in April and May of 2020. Um, and so this is kind of um, rough, but I, but I think there's also something that in the spirit of it that's quite enjoyable. And this is actually from the production of Rocking Horse Winter that was supposed to 
be at Crow's Theatre. Um, instead, we met uh, for the same amount of time that we would have been in rehearsal to just test out how well you could rehearse and possibly create on online tools. Um, and so I figured, why not start with the art? And if you'll hold on one second, I'll see if I can make this happen. Just for context, the story of Rocking Horse Winter is based on the D.H. Lawrence um, short story, which I'm sure some of you know, but it's about the relationship between a um, a mother and her son, essentially. Uh, the mother comes from a, a an, an previously entitled family, so where there would have been a stipend, you know, you wouldn't necessarily have to work to make ends meet, but is but is living during the time when fortunes were changing and there was the rise of the middle class in Britain. And uh, this co coinciding with not having a very healthy a relationship with her husband um, and not really being per perhaps ready to be a mother leads to a very fascinating relationship where she's always resenting her son for existing. He probably has some um, developmental challenges um, or maybe even on the spectrum. And, uh, and so he's in his room rocking on a rocking horse, even though he's well past the age when he should be. And she's um, trying to still be a debutante when she's well past that age as well. Uh, it's a very tragic uh, tension, but the beautiful thing is that the sun is filled with life and light and uh, and an obsession with the rocking horse. Um, and in this scene in particular, he's trying to explain to his uncle, who has just discovered that he has a kind of magical power to predict um, the winners of horse races that comes through riding this horse. It's a kind of Faustian bargain. Um, he's trying to explain to his uncle why he knows um, the names of the horses and also that the house that they live in sings to him. So he's hearing voices. Um, and this is, give me a second, if I can make this work well. There we go. Um, this is Asatha Tanakun and uh, Keith Klassen singing scene six from The Overcoat. And this again was really at the very beginning of the pandemic when we had no idea what we we're doing, but we figured we would give it our best try. Uh, please let me know if you can hear. We're going to record this um, with Zoom, which only will show the active videos. So we'll get an approximation of how the scenes work because the active characters will have their um, cameras on. Paul. How will you spend the money, Paul? You could buy a real horse. It's all for Mother, cause Mother is unlucky. And if I'm lucky, then maybe she'll stop singing. Don't you like your mother singing? No, not her. The house. I hate our house for singing. Not the house, Paul. Surely your mom. No, not her. The house, the walls, the ceilings. What does she sing about? Cobwebs and paint. short of money aren't we all she sees when the mail drops what do you mean Paul she sees Oh, my mom. 
There you are. So that's just a, uh, um, and you could you could all hear that okay, right? Great, great, great. Yeah. So that that was our April May last year. Um, really, uh, I, it, it, you could see the bar of faces on the bottom. Um, those uh, singers were very game because what we asked them to do was to film themselves. This was all filmed with phones and recorded with computer mics, um, and we asked them to. Uh, do a recording in the darkest space in their house. And that ended up with um, Midori Marsh, who's the most recent winner of the um, COC competition um, in her own bathroom. She said, I, she, because it was a single take, she's like, I had to record that for two hours, that one stretch, because I kept messing up um, and went through a whole pack of matches to do so. But um, it did allow us to start to play in the world of uh, um, video editing and filming and composition in a way that we hadn't really ever thought of before. Uh, and so there is something about necessity drives innovation that I think it will be a through line to the rest of the conversation today. So I wanted to pose a question which I'd love to talk with you about afterwards, which is, what is opera? Um, because I think that one of the most common answers would be it's the grand experience in the Great Hall, celebrating European masterpieces with full orchestra, sweeping and often tragic stories and romances, chorus, and some of the most remarkably powerful voices in the world. Um, but as a lover of science and history, I started off thinking that I would be a scientist or an engineer. My analytical side would suggest that history might say, if you look at the elements of opera, it is the combination of great music great drama and storytelling, great vocal virtuosity, and great visual spectacle working together for a synthesized dramatic musical storytelling experience. 
Now, I greatly prefer this definition because it creates more opportunity than restriction. And if you look again at history, at the evolution or growth of any art form, opportunity to grow is what drives great art. If you prefer the first version, then what I have to say today will maybe on the sacrilegious side, and we can talk about that as well later. <laughs> and certainly as someone who was trained as a boy soprano and, and got to learn, my love of music came through the greats, um, you know, Bach and Beethoven and Mozart. Um, I, I'm, I have time for the entire picture of opera, but I do believe that with the second definition, the first definition also fits in, but with the first definition, the second doesn't. So to return to opportunity, when the crisis started to happen about a year and a half ago, um, really um, opportunity is always present, but um, in a case of crisis, opportunity is how survival is defined. What opportunities are left for a company who is normally defined by live performances? And uh, I, I like the analogy of um, how do you make decisions if your boat is sinking? Um, you can stay on the boat, which is adjust your plans for the present with the hope that help will arrive before the boat sinks um, and that help will also bring normalcy back in some way. You can find the life rafts, um, which is to find a temporary but safer way to ensure survival. Um, or you can dive into the water because you know how to swim and you also know where you need to swim to. Um, and you have made a decision then to proactively act on your own behalf and not to wait for for anybody. And eventually, all of this probably should lead to building a ship without the weaknesses of the ship that was sinking. So I can say that at Tapestry, the one thing we didn't, didn't do was stay on the boat and wait for help. Um, we were actually the first um, pandemic related live stream in Canada, uh, converting what was to be a masterclass and subsequent mixed recital into a live stream performance with Christina Zabo and Christopher Foley. Uh, and subsequently, we were one of the first organizations in Canada to announce um, a combination of a year of postponements and cancellations alongside a new season that we called Immune to Cancellation. Because what we had learned from that very first pivot, turning a masterclass and recital into a recital for just two performers instead of 20, was that there is a great amount of work that goes into change um, as uh, it, those of you who have, I mean, I know you all have active colleagues at the university and the amount of time invested in thinking and rethinking and plan C and D and E was incredible. And so our idea was, let's make sure that we only have to have a plan A and a plan B, because if we have to go as far down as F, we will have spent a lot of work and a lot of time and have nothing in terms of productivity to show for it. Um, so our season that was immune to cancellation, which was a little bit cheeky, uh, featured uh, three main components, um, live stream concerts. And these were all things we'd never done before. So when, when Linda first invited me, she, she sort of did say, you know, we'd love to hear about your experiments. And this entire season was a great experiment because we hadn't live streamed before. Um, we hadn't really created any um, artistic video content before. So our second stream was gonna be digital shorts. And we felt that we might have some competency for this because we create um, performance shorts on a regular basis. Um, we didn't know at the time we announced that we would be creating music videos and feature films, but those came as well. And um, most fondly, we created a delivery stage, which we called box concerts, um, which one of our supporters jovially called a return to the medieval cart. Um, as it was one of the original technologies to bring um, music and theater to a town, it was just to put everybody on the back of a cart and drag it through town, attracting a lot of attention. So, and they're, they're, therefore bringing audiences to your show. Our version is, uh, is a trailer that's pulled behind a car, not even a truck, um, and is delivered to, uh, I should say to the state, we've already had almost 100 live performances in the greater Toronto area last summer and this summer, um, with about two thirds of those as free performances for care homes and hospitals. Um, and, uh, and with the kind of, we, you know, we kind of were both a little bit sneaky and a little bit clever in skirting the restrictions because our decision was to just go to where people were already safe, as opposed to do show, doing shows in parks, to say, if we go to your home, 
Um, the government has never restricted your ability to sit on your own porch. And so you can sit on your own porch and we can do a performance for you. And if we go to a hospital or care home, there are staff and protocols for um, outdoor activities already in place. And so those would also be protected. So we managed to mostly be um, immune to cancellation in that respect as well. Um, with these three initiatives, we, we were really investing in two tactics that Tapestry hadn't invested a lot in, in terms of engaging audience with opera. Now, the, the tactic that we all know is the live performance. Um, we promote a show, we make it attractive to you. If it's attractive enough, and if maybe there's a recommendation for a friend, you come to the show and buy your ticket, enjoy the show or not, talk about it, hopefully, either way. Um, but that was the one thing that we couldn't do. The other two main ways that we sort of distilled of bringing opera to folks are, sorry, one moment, I'm just going to close the door to the crying child. My uh, second daughter was born on February 29th, 2020. So on, on the leap year, um, right before lockdown. So she's only lived in this crazy time. Um, and she has very good lungs. So if anyone's gonna be a singer, it might be her. Um, but sorry, coming back to this, there's the three main tactics for getting opera to people, get people to come to you, go to people, go to where people are. And that's where our box concerts was one of our first experiments. Um, and then the other one is to go to where people are online um, to engage with digital content. Uh, so that that kind of was a really interesting way. Now, um, going back to the idea of sacrilege, uh, definitely, if you approach some super fans or true lovers of opera, you might say that it's lesser to have opera on a modified snowmobile trailer bought with cash, towed behind a car, um, Let's presume that some will say it's a lesser thing and others might even say, well, that's not really opera. And that's, I think that's okay. Um, I also think that there's prob this is probably where we're all a little bit guilty, but is it also not a lesser thing or even more of a compromise to have the glorious art form of opera reduced to something on a cell phone or a computer screen where probably those of us who normally go to the opera or the symphony at least one time this year have said, Said, well, it's not exactly the same, and I can't wait for it to come return to live. Um, again, I, I think that that is um, both fair and I have time for that, but it's also um, something to consider when we look at the experiments that we're doing. So I guess before I get a little bit more into what we what we did and learn, I wanted to share at least my um, uh, a little bit of what's under the hood with opera producing because I, I'm guessing that many of you have been, probably most of you have been to the symphony and as well as the opera, if not all of you. And, uh, but one of the things that is lesser known is, is sort of the, the, the workings of how the business model works. It's a very particular genre and very particular way of producing. Um, partly there's also the context. Um, currently civic opera companies, for example, the Met, Chicago Lyric, Calgary Opera, or the CUC have seen consistent small percentage declines in opera over the past 30 years. So that's somewhere between 0.5% to 1.5% um, decreasing per year for 30 years, pretty consistently across all of North America. Um, and if you look at the stats of population growth in urbanization in North America, you'll see that um, in those same 30 years, the urban population in North America has grown by 100 million, um, growing from 75% of the total population to 85% of the, top, the total population with an annual growth of roughly 1% per year, though in Toronto, that's actually been more. So there's an interesting correlation there. What's happening that the Opera House isn't attracting a similar percentage of the population when that population is also growing? So the the context the under the hood or the behind the curtain thing is that opera is the most expensive not-for-profit art form to produce um, now that may not be a surprise to you but it relies heavily on donation sponsorships and government subsidies and at the big houses this is what i found fascinating when i start, started to first find out about the producing side singers are paid per show so they may be rehearsing for four weeks and not be paid for it um, but they're paid per performance um, for example, you may, and, and they may be paid from 
even fifteen to twenty-five thousand dollars per performance. So a turn dot who does five performances could be making a uh, hundred thousand dollars for that production, which is kind of wild. And uh, if you take into account the cost of all of the singers plus the orchestra plus the chorus, um, you can start to get a sense of how uh, remarkably expensive this art form is now. Obviously, these are refined skill sets, and there's not that many people that can sing a turndot as a dramatic soprano role. Um, but it did, does kind of reflect on the point that, um, you know, I, co the cost of a really good ticket to the Four Seasons Center, we can agree, is expensive. Um, but it's really only 25% of the true cost of that ticket. Your $200 ticket is probably about an $800 cost to that company. So as a result, per show, even if sold out, almost all productions in North America would lose money if they extended their runs. So if they add shows, they lose more money than they make. Um, and that is a very, very interesting thing, especially in contrast with the musical theater model, which operates far more like the Venetian public opera houses. Um, when opera first went public, you know, out of the court and into the public, um, who compete for audiences with larger houses, longer runs, spectacular sets and machinery, and popular star singers. This is also one of the reasons why we see the same shows, because taking a risk in a 1,400 to 3,200 seat house, like the, the house in Montreal, I believe, is roughly 3,200 seats at Place des Arts, um, it, you have to rely on sure things like your Carmen, your Magic Flute, your Traviata, and your, your Bohème. It's not necessarily because the major producers in Canada don't love new works. It's that those risks are incredibly expensive if you were to take them. And uh, I think that's just something that's interesting to take into consideration. It's not necessarily that there's, you know, the major donor who says, I don't want to see anything new. It's that um, well, there's a lot of different considerations that work towards um, keeping the model producing the same 20 pieces in a different cycle, um, in, in a four year cycle. Um, you know, that's your Verdi, Puccini, Mozart, some Handel, and, uh, and maybe a little bit of French opera if you're lucky. So I guess my takeaway, because I'm a relatively new to producing, I was an artist as, as Michael said, since I was a boy soprano, um, singing in New York city, a mall in the night visitors. Um, but. My takeaway was that we urgently need to think about how we grow the audience for opera, for it to be healthy and sustainable. So that has to be what everyone in opera is thinking about, because that's the only answer to the question about will opera continue to be healthy and sustainable and survive? And that growth needs to be driven by innovation and experimentation because the current model is not producing growth and is showing signs of increasing reliance on fewer and fewer people and entities for funding. So therefore, alternate producing models and product lines, which I hate to say product lines because this is an art, but alternate producing models need to be considered legitimate and have legitimate investment for them to be proven. So I think coming back to the question of sacrilege, the interesting thing about this is if we are going to invest in experimentation, the target audience are not super fans or lovers of opera. They're really people who are opera curious and those who may not have had exposure yet. So the designations, which may feel rough to some when you hear it over and over again, um, are really subjective to that specific demographics point of view. And if you're looking at the opera curious are not necessarily a consideration. So rather experimentation and testing for what has resonance with a diverse audience should drive where we invest. Now, I, I came across this remarkable st statistic from the Canada Council in 2016. They actually found that, and it's interesting because I know there's some controversy around Canada Day, um, which you were referring to earlier, um, that the population of Canada, about 14% of them will attend classical music at least once in a year. Um, and the average percentage for new Canadians, so folks who have immigrated in their lifetime, um, is higher, is between 16 and 17 percent. So new Canadians are more likely to go to classical music than second generation, third generation Canadians. I found that fascinating because sometimes people talk really, really generally about who, you know, what people are going to what, but um, that also shows me the full potential of what we can do when we 
embrace the fullness of what it is to be Canadian in how we market and how we program classical music and opera. So in, to go back to our experiments, we had our me medieval cart, our snowmobile trailer that had built a box on top of it um, with a stage that opened up so that you could have a, a private performance at your house or at a care home. Um, and we had digital and now digital prior to this year, I think a lot of people would have cringed and sort of said, you know, well, the Met in HD is one thing. You go to the movie theater and you see some of the biggest stars in the world. That's pretty exciting. You also get close-ups in the way that you can never get with the price of the seats that you could afford at the Met. Um, so that was pretty cool. But that also, we know, was a very specific audience. People mostly, we're, um, the surveys we're showing were people who attend the opera regularly. It was not a new group of uh, folks. So what we thought was, um, we don't really want to do like grassroots living room shows where we'd seen a lot of, you know, singers sing, performing from a piano in their living room with it was poorly produced and you couldn't really hear the audio very well. And it was, a, you know, a, a camera stuck on a stick. So it was, it was nice at the, at the moment in time when we all needed to be reassured that people were okay and able to express themselves. But in the long run, it's not how people engage with videos online. Um, and we also knew that archival footage, which is what a number of companies were sharing, um, was never meant to be made into a produced video. And so, yes, also having one big picture of the stage, um, the music probably was going to be the best thing because you would have some great singing. But also, that's not the kind of thing that we want to sit on our couch and watch for an entire time. The Met, when they made all of their shows available, that's what I would sit and watch if I was going to do that because they had thoughtfully constructed that. So what could a company who is reasonably small in the opera world with a, only a budget of one and a half million versus the budgets of the 10 million plus companies, um, what could we do? And we went in a different direction that included um, music videos and sketch opera television. So uh, here's, a, here's just a very small sample of um, one of the things we did. Let's see if I can do this again. All right. So this is from our first episode of Sketch Opera Singers. Was I speeding or was I sweating? Or did you want an autograph from me? Here's my license and registration And a fine headshot, as you can see I sing Benny, a boss Puccini And okay, some day Pavarotti Have a good night So uh, that single short video, um, because one of the one of the experiments that we had a hypothesis about is oh, goodness, excuse me. Uh, one of the things that we had a hypothesis of this about was that short videos would behave well on the internet because that is how at least I and many of I'm sure many of you um, stumble across things is here's something that seems interesting. Uh, let me take a look at it for a few seconds and see if it's going to be something that'll engage me and if it does maybe i'll watch the whole thing and, and even go and see who made it and what what else they've made so we wanted to play in the world of short videos and see what was possible and that was super short it's less than a minute um, and the inspiration for this was actually about finding your light about opera singers who um, because of the pandemic would would respond by singing anytime a light turned on because they were missing the spotlight so much um, so that was the inspiration for that sketch. Um, this single short video has had over 100,000 views on different platforms, including YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. 100,000 views, which was way beyond what we thought was possible, um, uh, which, was, which also assisted with an increase uh, for those who watched the full first episode, which was roughly about 200 people, um, to grow from 200 to 10,000 people have now viewed the entire first episode of Sketch Opera Singers. Um, and another 60,000 have watched other short episodes. So that, that came from that set. So this was one of our experiments to see 
was it possible to create short punchy things that would behave in the way that the internet already behaves? So let's not try and recreate live performance. Let's really think about how the internet behaves and also keep our ethos at tapestry of being creative and playful and fun so that, you know, people are looking at something that can, that they can bite into right away. And I wanted to say, um, Michael mentioned Rocking Horse Winner and uh, Rocking Horse Winner is very close to my heart, but in the context of things, um, the original production of Rocking Horse Winner had seven performances in a 200 seat theater. And the only two sold out shows were the last two um, where we had the most people who had never heard of Tapestry or had heard by word of mouth. So probably somewhere between 1,000 and 1,200 people came to see that show. Um, this uh, half an hour show with uh, also short segmentable pieces has already had an impact on roughly 170,000 people. So for us, understanding that live performance was coming back was too large a risk to have shows canceled again and again to invest our human resources in. Um, it was also not dissimilar to this idea that the internet already knows how it behaves and that we can just find ways to adapt our process and our creativity and our artists into that world. So what we ended up with was this show, uh, SOS, Sketch Opera Singers. SOS felt very appropriate for this past year. Um, short, engaging content in, inspired loosely from Baroness von Sketch, some of you might know. And uh, the key there was that we did be able to excerpt for different platforms and extend the viewership to a much, much larger percentage. Uh, we explored music video with a, a piece called Where Do I Go, combining singer, songwriter, pianist Morgan Page Melbourne with um, dancer Natasha Poon and uh, filmic visual storytelling. So arguably still opera by that definition that we talked about in the beginning. We had what we called thoughtful recitals. So recitals that weren't, again, just a planted camera or two camera angles where there would be some dimension that would encourage people to engage in a video way. And the first one we had um, jazz pianist Roby Botosh. Those of you who are Toronto jazz lovers will know his work, um, or if you listen to Jazz FM. Um, he was working with painter Moses Salihu, and they both improvised an entire set. So Roby improvised a set not knowing what he would be playing, and Moses, um, in 40 minutes, painted a complete painting um, inspired by the music. The other one we had was Mireille Asselin, and we, it was sort of meant to be kind of like a, a house concert in Quebec where you'd invite some friends to, to play and, uh, and, and just host a little party. And so we had Mireille performing in our studio, but she had get video guests coming in and presenting works that reflected on the identity of Franco-Canadian culture, especially outside of Quebec and what that means to be not entirely Anglo-Canadian and not entirely Quebecois and that funny space in between. We did a feature film. I think I don't think we were even um, knew that we were doing a feature film when we were working on it, but we made uh, a dramatic adaptation of Anna Sokolovich's love songs with Shin Wong and Wallace Holiday. Um, created a complementary story to the original thematic material, um, and we converted our studio into a film studio. Essentially, uh, we we also used last year and what was happening to to invest in equipment so that we would have the, the requ requisite equipment to record high level audio and video. Um, and as I didn't mention before, when we changed, when we did that first film version of Rocking Horse Winner, we, we had sort of two components to the contract. One was that rehearsal period um, and the other was the production period. And we converted the fees from the production period into making an album recording. And that album recording was featured last December on Saturday afternoon at the opera and heard by 300,000 Canadians hosted by Ben Hepner. So now there's a different life there. So we did our best to convert all of the energies that were going into last year into new ways of reaching more people. So what's, what's true about some of this is that there's a very attractive component to video opera. Um, I don't think we know exactly what's going to work the best, but we've learned a lot about the direction that it can go in order to be exciting to some people who are already lovers of opera and some people who are just interested in great video, as the kids call it, content. Um, but the other interesting thing is that it's evergreen. We, if you do a production of Bohem or Rocking Horse Winner, it is there for the period that shows are going on live. Um, but with videos, if they work for the genre, they will be there forever and attract 
um, additional views forever and contri contribute to a growing portfolio representing the art form. So I find that to be really exciting and interesting. I also hope that what's true, as you know, in love, first impressions are very important. You want to make a good impression the first time. But I want to, what I hope is that all of these diverse videos showcase a dynamic and vibrant dimension to opera that can make that first great and second impression on those who are curious. Um, just to say, um, it's not this one thing. It has infinite possibilities, in fact. And there's a lot of them that are uh, fascinating, funny even. Um, and uh, I grew up doing Gilbert and Sullivan, so I'm, I'm totally okay with opera being funny. Um, and, uh, and maybe maybe we'll see what we'll see is that there could be an on like a growing audience for operatic content online that would overflow into in-person attendance and hopefully in-person attendance in different ways and so that was where i'd like to finish this uh first part of the presentation um linda also asked me what's coming up for the future and i, I wanted to share a little bit about that which is the return of the original component of what we do which is live performance in really thrilling ways um, so this coming season, uh, we'll be producing a world premiere of a show called Gould's Wall by Brian Current and Liza Balkin. This is in investigating the artist's journey. It's going to be on the wall of the old conservatory of music. So if you've ever gone to Kerner Hall and you're walking through the sort of atrium and you know there's two levels to it, there's one where the cantina is and there's the top level that goes directly to the lobby, you can see the old wall of the old conservatory on the left as you're going towards the lobby. So that is where we'll have our singers climbing in the air as they sing and explore this idea of a young uh, performer who sees themselves in the shadow of Gould. This was kind of inspired by Liza and Brian, who both work at the conservatory, um, thinking about all of the music and all of the angst that's been soaked up by those walls over the last um, decades. Uh, and, and how, you know, what would it be like if the walls sung there and you know also how how is a person like glenn gould who's striving for perfection was legendary in the pursuit of you know recording perfection after he sort of started to perform less and less um i found that to be super fascinating so we decided to go ahead with this production and so if you choose to attend you will be singing singers singing out of windows singing singers singing on on uh, being flown through the air uh so it'll be a lot of fun also something that is perhaps a little bit extra. Uh, the other major world premiere that we have next year is in May, which I feel the most comfortable about, um, though I hope I hope this room is mostly double vexed. Um, and that is the world premiere of Rossum's Universal Robots, or RUR, A Torrent of Light, based on Karel Chapek's um, 1920 play uh, with the same title, Rossum's Universal Robots, um, which was the invention of the word robot. And uh, this was kind of inspired in the moment about, a few, about six years ago when we were discussing collectively how Google or the parent company of Google has bought eight of the 10 largest robotics and, and artificial intelligence companies in the world. And we still know Google just as a browser, but that crazy dog with a hand for a head that Boston Robotics has is now under the same parent company, as is DeepMind, which is one of the world's leading researchers of artificial intelligence. And this was part, partly to hypothesize what happens when the biggest um, data collection in the world on humans combines with all of these other top technologies. What is going to be the product that comes out of that, which is both fascinating and terrifying and likely going to happen in my lifetime. Um, so that that will be with composer Nicole Lise, who's out of Montreal, fantastic composer, um, and Governor General Award winner Nicolas Billon, um, who some of you might have seen his uh, The Butcher at Mervish um, or Elephant Song. He's uh, he's been been kind of doing some incredible playwriting in the last little while, and uh, that will be at OCAD University in partnership with them, um, where we're creating new technologies for this. So it'll be a com combination you know, physical theater sort of um, hypothesizing about the movement and of robots, as well as playing with the question of what is real and what isn't, where Nicole Zee is a specialist at um, the acoustic sound combined with the digital sound and raising the question of where the borders are. When do we know for sure which one is real? And uh, that seems to apply really, really well to this particular story set where 
um, a kind of Wozniak and Steve Jobs combination of a husband and wife um, are arguing about whether or not to give more autonomy to their creations um, because the question of making money versus um, exploration and perhaps independence is one that comes up. If we create robots and they are intelligent and they become independent, do they then have rights to be independent? Um, so that is a big, super, super juicy um, world of design and I think uh, um, philosophical questions. And that will be in May next year. So we're coming back with that good stuff as well. So to, uh, to finish, I, I thought I would um, send us out on a good note and I'd love to answer any questions that you have. Um, so here is, I should say, literally, I'd like to end on a high note. Let's see if I can find this. This was done by um, Keith Claussen, who you saw in the, um, the first excerpt. Um, and we kind of gave him free reign to do anything. And he happens to be a marathon runner and decided to do this, an actual marathon. This catchy tune. How many kilometers am I hoping to cover? 42.2, 42.2. Why am I wearing a suit and tie and pair of sneakers? You want to know, you want to know. The sneakers are for the running and the suit is, it's just for show, it's just for show. Running, singing, how hard will it be? An optional high C. What should we do with silly ideas when they come to you and me? Pursue them to the ends or just leave them be. It's getting hotter and I think I'm chafing between my thighs, between my thighs. My choice of dress is proving to be suspect. That's no surprise. That's no surprise. My silly idea I should have been singing, sitting, possibly reclined, possibly reclined. Legs keep going, you're so near the end. Boys, don't let your determination bend. The marathon is almost done, no more running will there be. I'll never do this again. Thank you so much, Michael. I my think pleasure. 